different in end. And what you see is that it's a 64 cores uh, uh, socket, but it's not uniformly accessed. You have actually groups of eight cores with, with each their own memory. And that means that it's not really a shared memory uh, setup in a sense. Like it is shared memory because you can access it without noticing it. But in practice, if this core number one tries to access memory from the last one, you will actually pay some cost because it's actually a slow transfer, much faster than MPI, of course, uh, when you have different nodes, but it's still slower than if it was really shared memory on the same socket and the same uh, memory. Uh, so this actually is a problem. Uh, I'm actually stuck right now because of this uh, recording. Okay, wait, this is still working. Uh, so that means that when we develop a code, we have to really completely rethink the way we parallelize. And ideally, it's very difficult nowadays to just parallelize a code which is already existing. It's better to just restart from scratch and think how should it be developed, how should it be structured to optimize this parallelism. And this has motivated the group at KTH in particular, but a bunch of other groups uh, throughout Scandinavia, especially, uh, to create a new program from scratch. And once we did this, we also had a second motivation behind it. Uh, most of those people were from the Dalton community. And they noticed that this Dalton program was just getting out of hand. It was growing bigger and bigger. There were more and more interlocking parts, and it was uh, really becoming a mess. And I think we can all acknowledge it's the same in all old codes, like Molkas has the same problem. And it's a problem for the users because maybe they need only a fraction of what the program offers, but they have to download the whole big thing. There's also a problem for, a problem for developers because the codes just organically entangled. You start with a very clear idea of this is this and this is that. And over, over time, they just start coding each other. And I remember like a few years ago, uh, Ignacio made a map of Molkas to try to see if we could de-entangle this. And it was just noted everywhere. It was impossible. And this can make it difficult to maintain codes and develop new ones. So what we want is to go to a more modular design, where basically every function lives in its own space. And we interact only by calling other ones, in, like not inside the same code. Basically, it's just different codes independent, which can interact with each other. And for that, we have decided to go for the Python environment because it is just uh, very easy to do this modular design with it. Uh, so, for example, we have developed two different programs that we to speak about today, which is the Luxian and Multisci. And they exist separately, but by just having those two lines, I'm importing them together. Now they, I can use both of them completely seamlessly. And of course, Python is not the only uh, program which can afford this thing, but it's uh, quite convenient. And from this, uh, while in the old way, we could still have two different programs. So we actually have this with Chromax and Molkas, probably. But then communication is done through files, typically. Here we can actually communicate through just sending the object in memory, because everything is existing in the same, in the same space, eventually, once you have imported everything. And finally, you might think that, well, as a user, if you have more and more programs to install, it just becomes a mess. Already one program to install can be difficult. But now you want to install 10 of them. Uh, but fortunately, Python comes from those very powerful package managers, PIP and Conda, where for the user, in most cases, uh, just a simple command installs everything and takes care of all dependencies and everything like this. It's very convenient to install as many programs as you want. And of course, Python also comes from other things, that it's very clean and simple syntax. Uh, it's a very object-oriented, which makes it always, I think, easier to maintain in the long run, easier to program into. It has already standard libraries, which are extremely convenient, especially NumPy, if you want to do any linear algebra, extremely powerful. And it has also this uh, interactive interface, Jupyter, which I'm going to uh, show a bit later. And that thing that makes it an ideal environment for teaching and developing. And I'm going to try to illustrate this. So this has been sort of the philosophy we use when we build this program called VelopScan. So what we wanted is to use Python as much as possible. So most of the VelopScan code is written in Python. It's only for the core parts where performance is more important that we need to switch to C++. Because Python is not the fastest programming language. Uh, but the good thing is that you can 
you have this PyBind library, which allows you to basically expose this C++ code to Python as if it was a Python code. So as a, when you're writing in Python, you don't actually know if this class you're manipulating is a C class or a Python class. It doesn't show, it just shows as a Python object. And this from laptop to HPC, the idea behind this is that we want to have a code which has HPC optimized, so high performance computing optimized routines, so that you can write state of the art program, the program which is fast and as fast as it can be on this modern architecture. While at the same time, having something which is very intuitive to program into uh, and to use as well as teaching. So, like that's a laptop part. Because Everything is accessible directly to the user. As a Python, you can just write, okay, I want the integrals, get integrals, poof, you have an array of integrals, as simple as that. And you can program anything you want in a few lines with this. So basically, it's what I mean by this pseudocode. At the end, your Python code is almost as simple as the pseudocode that you write in your papers to explain the algorithm. It's just a one to one mapping almost. Uh, so if you want to do it in action, uh, this is the only command you need to install it, you just type this on your terminal and you have the log scan. And you open a notebook and you can start having fun. And I'm going to do just that if I can. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, uh, so I have set up a little notebook. You see it perfectly. So this is what a notebook looks like, a Jupyter notebook. Uh, so it is on the web browser, uh, but it's a Python code that you can write. And you have different cells, and you can activate one cell at a time. And as you're running those cells, everything that has been done there, all the memory that normally is in the code, is accessible at that point. So you can really, it's a bit like a debugger, where you stop the code right after this, and you can just manipulate all the variables, see what's happening. So for example, this is how you would run a velox scan calculation. We define the molecule, it's just water. Uh, we read it into this Velox scan object. Uh, then we define a basis set, CCPVDZ. If I just run this, uh, it takes a while because my computer is slow and Zoom is a lot of resources for it. But maybe it's done, okay. And then if I want to define a hard tree fork, I create this uh, object, which is a hard tree fork driver. And at that point, if I want, I can put some little like uh, parameter. For example, if I want to define the number of max iteration, uh, I just get like, max iter equal 10. Like, I can change the setting at that point. Uh, but it doesn't matter. And I just run it, and it just computes everything. So this is sort of, in, in that sense, not very difficult from what you would do uh, in a code. But the nice thing is that my, my variables are still alive in the notebook. So if I want some to get the energy, I don't need to rerun anything. I just, I mean, it's available. Every, everything is available. If I want to get, example, these are the orbital energies. So there's this small orb, which is the orbitals. And then there's this uh, function here to get the alpha orbital energies. I just click on it and I can get them. Everything is accessible here if I want to. And here you didn't see that this small orb object is actually a C object, but you don't know it. It's, you're in Python and everything looks like Python to you. Uh, so this is sort of nice. Uh, you can also using this uh, predefined help function that uh, Python comes with. So as long as in the code you have put the commands as you're supposed to, by just uh, asking for help, it tells you how this compute function is supposed to be called. So okay, you need the molecule, you need the basis, and there is a default value, but you can also give the minimal basis because it starts with a small basis and extrapolates to the large basis. So by just doing this, you see everything you want to know. And then. Uh, the teaching aspect or the developing aspect is that you can actually write your own hard tree fork yourself. And it's really very simple. So you get all the information you need, number of uh, basis function, number of occupied orbitals, all the integrals, so this is uh, energy, all the integrals, you get them, the kinetic energy, the nuclear potential, then you can form the core Hamiltonian by just T minus V. You get the two electron integrals. This is not the way we would do it if we want it to be efficient, but we can just Ask them, okay, I want the whole tensor of integrals. You run this, now it's in my memory. And for example, if I want to autonomize, it's one of the first things you need to create this automation matrix. This is a formula, you need to first diagonalize the overlap, and then you need to uh, create this uh, matrix. Well, that's the code. You diagonalize the overlap, and then you have this uh, Einstein summation, which is a very powerful NumPy thing, where you just follow the index. So uij, or uik, U, I, K, uh, sigma K, uh, power one half, sigma 
k power one half j k j k and you just run this and you have your x matrix computed just one line and then from this you can recognize the block matrix so this is the equation well you just write it with the index index like last time to multiply this by this x matrix they can analyze it and then uh, reform the coefficients Oof, that's my function and I can write a hot refoc where I compute the density matrix by just multiplying the occupied orbitals together. I compute the flock matrix. That's a Coulomb part. You can see the index ij kl contracted with density kl gives the ij flock matrix. Same thing for the exchange. Everything very easy to read. You compute the energy by just integrating over the whole thing, adding nuclear potential energy. Uh, here you want to compute the so you transform the flock matrix to the MO basis to compute the occupied virtual block because that's your gradient. And if you compute the norm of that, uh, that would give you the error basically, and that's your convergence threshold. And the the flock matrix to get the new coefficients. And you run this, and that's it. You have a artifact code. So for teaching quantum chemistry, this is so easy because instead of having equations which are very abstract, you give them a code and they can just write it themselves. And they will immediately see all the pitfalls that they don't think, oh yes, I forgot about the automation matrix, otherwise it doesn't work. But you can really play with it and you can try, okay, this was a, the guess was just the core Hamiltonian. Can I do something better? You just write a few lines, you see, oh yes, it starts with a better energy. This, this type of thing is very, very easy to program. I see two questions in the chat. Is open mode class compatible with Velox scan? Not currently. Uh, would Julia be useful in avoiding writing? I don't know much about Julia, so I cannot answer that. Anyway, so this was uh, just to illustrate a bit how this thing works. You can go back to the presentation now. Uh, so I think I've managed to convince you at least how powerful this uh, Python and this notebook interface can be to really develop and teach. Uh, for what is of concern to me, and I guess to some extent to you, uh, is that so various scan only does half reflux and DFT. But as we said, we want to have this modular design. So I wanted to implement CSCF, and I instead of implementing it in the scan, I made my own little program called MultiSci, which is sort of an extension of Velox scan, uh, but for multi reference calculations. It's using the same philosophy, and it's using integrals from Velox scan. But uh, I have written my own CI functions. So it's in C++ because this needs to be efficient. But most of the rest of the code is in Python. So the CI optimization, like I said, CF, everything else that I'm building on top is written in Python. So currently, I have only a few functionalities. I started last year. I have a general CI code I can do in principle any expansion you might think of. Uh, I have a state average or state specific MCSCF, MCPDFT. Uh, transition properties at the set average level, so like RASI basically. Uh, and also a very nice and convenient interactive orbital viewer. So if you want to select this space in a notebook, you have a very easy tool to do that. I will show you later. And soon coming uh, MCSCF gradient and MCSCF response. Soon meaning that it's almost done, but a few missing parts. Uh, and again, I will show you quickly what it looks like. Uh, so you have the same system. Now you just need to import multipsi also. So before I had imported the log scan, now I'm importing multipsi. You define a molecule as benzene. All of those have a log scan object. Uh, and I'm going to compute the heart rate for guess as a start. Because uh, it's, it's good enough start. And this is going to take a bit more time because it's, uh, again, zoom. <laughs> Uh, and then we have this orbital viewer, and that's in multi sites that's in my code. So I really need to be extremely fast to plot any size of any size of molecule. So you don't have to wait for the grid generation. It's really, really fast. The grid is not as accurate as you might hope, but it's uh, still pretty decent. And then I want the pi system. I just, OK, well, this is a pi orbital. Uh, let's just click it active. And I just go through them. This one is probably the same because it's degenerate. Uh, this one is a sigma, I don't want it, uh, and that's another pi, uh, pi star, pi star, and I think I don't remember exactly, but I think it's this one, nope, uh, good enough, this one. 
And then I just save it as a H5 file. So I could do it directly from memory, but in general, I like to save my orbital files because I want to reuse them later. And then I'm defining this orbital space. That's my uh, new object from this multi code. And then I define the MCSCF driver and I give it uh, molecule basis and space and I just run it. And it reasonably quickly uh, converges. So you have exactly what you would expect from the CASSCF code. And then you can double check your orbitals by just providing the space. So here it's again through memory directly, but you could do it through a file if you wanted to. And just check that, uh, yep, these are my orbitals and they remain as I wanted. I also have a nice warning. So if my active space changes too much between the start and the final iteration, I have a little warning printed saying that something probably went wrong. This is always nice. But anyway, this is how easy you can run like a CF on this uh, program. And again, it's built with the same thing. So you can also get any matrix that you want from the code and develop your own, whatever you want to develop based on that. For example, when I, when I implemented CASDFT, MTPDFT, it took me half a day. I just spent the morning, it was rainy, I didn't want to get out, I just walked and I poof MTPDFT. Um, anyway, so I think I've convinced you of the usability. Uh, now let's switch a bit more to the performance. How much time do I have? Perfect. As I said, we don't just want to have something which is nice and easy to play with, but we also want something which is efficient when you want to run it for production calculation. Uh, so for MCSCF, you have two main costs. Uh, you have the CI, uh, which is basically factorial in the A, which is active space size. And that dominates if your active space is very large. If your active space is anywhere be below 10 orbitals, I would say this is not the main cost. And at this, case, at this point, the Integral transformation is the dominant cost, and that's the A times N4, so N number of basis function and A number of active orbitals. Uh, so let's first focus on the second one, this integral transformation. Uh, this is in principle the equation, and the most expensive part is actually the one inside when you have four AOs conflicted with one MO. After that, you start to get A because you have more and more uh, active MOs, which is probably a small number compared to the number of total uh, orbitals. So this is the main task is this one. And this transformation is actually quite difficult to parallelize because every half step that you are, every quarter step you do, then you need to re-exchange between nodes depending on how you implement things. It's actually not super easy. Uh, and it works quite well if everything fits in memory because uh, then you have no problem with the unit stride. But if you have, uh, because the second, this step can be quite easy, like those index are continuous, but then the second step index will not be continuous anymore. So it, this thing is not ideal presented this way. Uh, what we've implemented instead, actually we've implemented both, but uh, is a more direct fashion where it's fork matrix based. And why fork matrix? Because you could, if you do the first two transformation, you can actually combine those two C's into basically a matrix, which looks very much like a density matrix. So for each TU, so for each active orbital pair, you have this fork matrix construction. And the bad thing is that it has, in principle, a higher cost because now we're transforming twice instead of once. So we have this A squared N4. So it's, in principle, more expensive. But it's similar to a fork matrix construction. And most codes have a very optimized fork matrix construction. And in particular, the Velox scheme has been designed precisely to uh, create as many fork matrix as, at once as we can. So you provide a bunch of densities, it returns you a bunch of uh, fork matrix. That's really what it's been designed around. And one of the main thing with that is that you have a very efficient screening because now it's the density that you have. And again, you have very optimized uh, algorithm to screen top matrix construction. So despite having a higher formal cost in practice, it's actually going to be often for large system cheaper than doing just a plain uh, multiplication like you would normally. And then for prioritization, you just basically, what we found to be most efficient and it might change when we have a new integral code, I don't know, is to simply distribute the densities. So each node gets a fraction of the density, so a fraction of the TU. And they all recompute the integrals completely, uh, but we found this to be more efficient overall. And just for illustration, uh, I took this system, 100 atoms, 1,000 basis function. I put 14 orbitals in my active space. So again, the normally the cost scale as a, squ a squared N4. So the more orbitals in active space, the worse it gets. 
Uh, and I didn't use RI or anything. This is just brute force conventional calculation. And I have a super linear scaling, which we see quite often for some reason in the Velox game. Uh, it might mean that, I don't know, batching might be improved, should be improved for the, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so I, have a, I only showed for four nodes, but uh, Velox game has been tested to, I don't know how many hundreds of nodes. It's, it's scaling perfectly almost up to moments where you have one basis function per node, basically. I mean, it's, I'm exerting a bit, but it's pretty much that. And for this case, again, conventional, uh, the time that I have was for four nodes, 32 cores each, uh, six minutes and a half per iteration. So for a big molecule like this, this is, I think, pretty good knowing that it's conventional. And uh, one important thing is that we actually have almost finished rewriting the integral code because actually we went, they were not quite happy with the way it was performing. And it's not finished, so I can't give you actual timings, but the tests so far show that we can probably factor a factor of 10 probably for these type of things, maybe more. So we might bring this down even more. Anyway, so this was for the orbital part, uh, but we also sometimes have very large cast uh, expansions. And so we want to do also CI parallelization. And here, uh, our inspiration is this paper from the Olson's group, uh, where they parallelize the CI so what we want, because a CI vector basically is very large, so often you are memory bound more than really time bound. So you want to split the CI vector over all the nodes that you have available. Each node should have only a fraction of the CI vector. And the way they propose to do this is using the gas strategy, general active space. Basically, you take your gas space and you just cut it into small pieces, so small orbital pieces. And that indirectly cuts the CI expansion into little fragments corresponding to how many uh, electrons you have in each space. That's sort of how it works. So for example, if you had a closed shell cast, so like, uh, I don't know, 10 in 10, and you said you divide into two, the first five orbitals are my first subspace and the second orbital is the second subspace. Then you have the hard default determinant, which is uh, 10 electrons in the first subspace and zero in the second one. Then you have the CI singles type where you have nine electrons in the first and one in the, in the second. And that, this is how you divide basically the, the subspaces. And then you just put as many as you can on each node to make it approximately even. Uh, and the great thing by doing this is that uh, because the Hamiltonian only interacts at most two electrons, that means that you can only do two excitations. So by having these CI singles doubles in this example, you see that the singles will not interact with the quadruples and principles. So you introduce basically locality in your CI space, meaning that each node only interacts with a few other nodes at best. And that's sort of the key idea between this. You want to reduce how many node communication you have. Uh, so this is sort of this graph here. So when you compute the sigma vector from the CI vector, you do a double excitation. And so you have this interaction map where this sigma vector only depends from, from this own node and the next node and nothing more. One of the main downsides from this is that it creates very uneven group size. So you need to probably create more groups than you would want just to make sure that the task balance is approximately good. Uh, but the good thing, as I said, is that they don't interact with each other. So you have locality in your memory. Uh, one other uh, problem with this idea is that uh, it creates actually quite a lot of overhead. So by splitting your, your space like this, you actually increase the cost slightly. And some of that was a paper where they published this idea you see that the same calculation, the same number of nodes, just having more subspaces uh, increase the costs. And of course, the more nodes you want to put, the more subspaces you will have to create. So in, in a sense, that means that your scaling goes down. So here you see scaling with the same number of nodes, and this looks very good, but you will always have to increase the number of groups when you want to have more nodes. So what I found is that uh, a good strategy is to actually rebind the groups within one node. So you, you probably make, as I said, too many, but you rebind them once you have allocated them in some way. So it's a bit complicated to explain, but that's sort of how it works. And also, they are using MPI for everything, even for the different cores in the same node. And that's not efficient, because in this case, communication is not that expensive, so we can do better. So in my case, I do not divide gas spaces within my node. I keep it as one. And what I'm doing instead is that the CI vector and sigma vectors are stored as matrices with the alpha configuration on one side and the other side. 
And again, I want to take care of this NIMA thing. So it's shared memory, but it's not that shared. So I still want to avoid as many communications as I can between the different calls. So if I want to do alpha excitations, I just split along the beta because uh, when I do excitations, a full column of my CI vector becomes a full column of my SIMA vector. So there is no interaction between the calls. And then if I want to do beta excitations, well, I reorganize my matrix and split into the alpha. So there's only one time where I do communication and all the intensive part actually is done without communication. So that's much better than just the, if you don't think about this thing basically. So quickly, I will show the results. Uh, this is the scaling I get for CAS 1616. It's not perfect. Uh, at some point it becomes memory bound. So like I have more cores, but I don't have more memory sockets. That's, so I'm just limiting by waiting for memory to come. Uh, but it's still pretty good. So for 64 cores, I'm getting a factor of uh, 40, 50 uh, for triplets and a bit less for singlets. I will not explain why. Uh, then I can go to MPI for more, more nodes. So I had to take a slightly bigger calculation and you can see again, super linear scaling for MPI. So again, quite nice. And at the end, the largest optimized CI ever uh, is this, I did it with this code. It's a CAS 2222, fully conventional, no DMRG, no approximation, nothing. It's 400 billion determinants. And I took, granted a very large computer <laughs> just because I, I need to make it fit in the memory. Uh, and it, it took about a bit less than three hours per iteration. So in the paper from this group that I mentioned, they did a bigger one, but just one iteration. I could actually optimize the CI completely. So it's, uh, if you can afford that many calls, of course, uh, it's pretty efficient. In practice, the point is that for 16 and 16, or even 18 and 18, nowadays it just takes seconds, and that's what you want. Uh, so at the end, conclusion, uh, I presented you a new platform, uh, which has many different goals, to teach quantum chemistry applications and methods. We actually have a, a project for that, for the ECAM project. So we have made a full ebook showing how to use our code to really explore quantum chemistry. Uh, quickly prototype new ideas, new programs, and uh, for production calculation. And with that, thank you for your attention. We have only one minute for uh, questions, unfortunately. So, uh, yes, I'm pretty much more uh, agile money. Uh, so the, do I mean it right? A third idea would be to kind of uh, either rewrite the entire code such that it can be read through Jupyter or write uh, Moldcast uh, using, I don't know, SPPI or some other sort of... Well, so, I mean, clearly we did our own pilot code, so it's a completely different thing. So it's completely Python-based. Uh, but if you were to, like, for example, we have already a bit of a Python interface in Moldcast, and you could uh, extend it by having there are different libraries depending on which program you want to interface with. But yes, you, you could have some functions to access a bit more the inner workings of the code, uh, which is currently not the case in more class. Because I mean, the concept you are sending is uh, really nice, but if uh, I want to adopt it, I need to turn to your software. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so we want to develop obviously products. you would be welcome to do this, uh, but so yes, you can easily, I think even uh, Shark Fumper did that, where they actually they use also in PyBind or maybe something different, but anyway, so you have a few C, you add a few C routines to your code, which gets you access to different things and then expose those to Python and that gives you more interactivity. So you can build it on top of an existing software, absolutely. And so, I mean, especially looking at, let's say, QC or DMRG, you know, we usually have very costly, or often have very costly CI stuff that would run on the HPC cluster and then cheap SCF running on the workstation. With uh, the, all the driver abstraction, we already have it set up such that you can, the, kind of, the drivers know about load levelers and can automatically send off calculations to the cluster, wait for them, and then do the SCF. So I, I feel like you could probably do that. I mean, for example, yeah. all the drivers you give the communicator, the MPI communicator, and I suspect that if you were to give specifically the cluster there and leaving the SCF on the our core, it might be able to work. I, I don't know how you would do this. Maybe Roberto would have more ideas, but 
All right. Uh, we have to thanks uh, Mr. Craig again. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it 